Hello everyone and welcome to the OM Genomics Show. I'm Maria Nadestad. In a recent video I did on bioinformatics project ideas, I mentioned a project where I ran PCA on some genotype data from populations around the world and someone asked me if I could do a video on how to actually do that project again. I shared a little bit of the details in that video, but in this video I'll actually show you what data to download, how to parse the VCF yourself, get it into a matrix and then run PCA on it at the end. And so this is going to be kind of a walkthrough. It's going to be a nice little case study of how to do a small bioinformatics project. And we'll encounter a few bioinformatics tools along the way that you might need for other projects as well. So there should be some decent small skills involved and also just giving you an idea of how I would approach finding data, gathering it, collecting it, and visualizing it, and stuff like that. So let's jump into it. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is go hunt for some data. So I know that the Thousand Genomes Project has genotypes from people who are from different places in the world, and I bet that they also will tell us where those people are from in the world. So that's what I'm going to search for. 1000 genomes VCFs. Let's go to the first page we see here. And so this contains a lot of information about the VCFs and about how the data is collected and stuff like that. What I do on here is basically try to figure out where they put the files, which is sometimes a little difficult, but I found an FTP link in here and we know that FTP is usually where files are stored. So we can basically take this and copy it in. And now if I just hit enter, it'll probably start to try to download this file. So I don't want that. I'll just go up to the nearest directory and see if I can get it to list the data. So now it says it wants to open Finder. So I'm on a Mac. And here the name and password is really only needed if you have if you need like special access to some data, but here it's publicly available. So you can just say guest and that'll connect it. And here I changed it to list view and we can see all these VCFs. Okay. So in here we have a bunch of VCFs and you can see they're from different chromosomes. I can also see that many of them are multiple gigs of data. So I'll probably lean towards taking one of the smallest chromosomes. I'm just going to take one of the smallest autosomes, which is chromosome 22. So now that I've chosen which VCF I want to download, let's download it from the command line, which is always a good thing to know how to do, especially if you're working on a different system. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it into the command line. And it says volume slash because it's mounted on my computer and that's not really what we want right now. So I'm going to go and find the path that we were at before. This part matches. So I'm just going to grab this part and paste that in. And this should be good. So this is going to take a little while to download. So we have, we have a VCF and then we have the .tbi index file for that VCF. So you can see it's like 1.8 gigs. This was a lot faster to download when I had a link that kind of accessed AWS directly. So I'll put that in the description for you. All right. So the next thing we want to do is take a look inside the VCF file. So you can try to use something like this, less dash s, but sometimes it'll correctly see that it's a gzipped file and it'll like ungzip on the fly. But in this case, it only does the binary. I'm also trying zcat, but it doesn't seem to find it. One thing that you can always do if you're having trouble with this is g unzip. And if you use dash k for this, you will keep the original file. And we want that because we don't usually want to keep the dot VCF around if we also have the VCF dot gz because the VCF is going to be way bigger. So let's try to do this and see how big the file gets. 
Wow, 14 gigs. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do is take a look at this file. I have an alias for L, which is just for last dash capital S. So let's look inside our VCF here. So there's a bunch of information in the header, but what I'm really interested in is just checking that we do in fact have chromosome 22 like we thought. You can see that this is a VCF with many samples in it. So after the format column, you have these different sample names. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So the columns aren't really lining up here, but you can basically see something like this for every sample, and there's many samples. So this is great. This is what we want. And look at the sample names, they all start with HG. One thing we don't have in the VCF is of course the population data, right? We want to actually know which population each of the samples is from. Here we have the genotypes, which is one half of the equation, but what we're trying to understand is whether the genotypes correlate with where in the world people come from. And so we need to have that information available as well so we can kind of, you know, label our PCA plot at the end with the truth. Okay, so I've just clicked around this website a little bit looking for populations and I get this cool map right here. So that's pretty sweet. And I see a download link, so I'm going to try to grab that because I ultimately do want a file I can work with on the command line. So excellent. Uh, let's drag that to the command line and I'll copy it or I'll move it from my downloads folder into this folder and take a look. So here, oh, this is cool. We have population code, population elastic ID, population name. Okay, so for instance, PUR means Puerto Rican and they're Puerto Rican in Puerto Rico. And there's additional information here. Looks like we have latitude and longitude, superpopulation codes, and information on how the data was collected and when. So this is great. What this doesn't tell us is which sample is which population. You see all those HG and then a bunch of numbers sample IDs that we had before in the VCF? They're not in here. So this is gonna be really great if we need additional information on the different population codes later, but right now we need the data to link from the sample ID to the population code. So let's see where we can find that. What we might wanna do actually is pull up the FTP site we were on before and see if there's any additional information there, which would presumably be about the same samples. So we do this again, guest connect. Okay. All right, in here I see additional VCFs, which are probably not gonna help us. Integrated calls.panel, and then there's some readme files. Let's try this panel file and see if that will give us some context. So drag that here again. And let's just, let's again copy this and I'm gonna put that in our notes because we should have saved that last time because it's helpful information. And so we're gonna take this and remove the volumes part. And then this seems to be like a date is duplicated. And there we go. So we're gonna download this panel file and take a look at it. Ooh, perfect. Okay, it's got sample IDs and it's got population codes. So now that we have all of that information, what we need to do is get the genotypes into a matrix form where we can run PCA on it. And then we wanna take this panel file and use that to color the points in the plot after we've run PCA and plotted the results, we want to be able to label 
which populations people are actually from so we can see whether they're clustering based on those populations, at least roughly. So what I'll use for this is Python. I think that's probably one of the best programming languages that you could use for bioinformatics. I've talked about why and recommended it in other videos. So I'm going to make a file called vcf to matrix. Oh, hi. I could also do this from here just by creating a new file by clicking this little icon, but this also works. And let's start writing something. So when you're doing a kind of one-off analysis like this, you can totally hard code file names and everything like that. But you could also use something like arg parse, just a Python library that helps you parse command line arguments. So the first thing we'll do is parse the VCF. So we could do VCF file name equals, this is copilot being helpful. I'll do the VCF.gz because again, I might just want to delete the VCF but right now I'm keeping it so we can still inspect it if we want to. So this is good. So that's the VCF file name. And I'll also do the panel file name. To parse the VCF, I'm going to use PySAM. This is because it is one of the ways to parse various genomics files, which is very easy to install. Um, I literally got this working just by on the command line going pip install pysam. And so you just run that and it'll install pysam on your system. And that's pretty great. On your computer, you might not have pip, but try pip3 instead. So you can Google how to use this, but basically what I'll do is say with variant file and I'll use vcf file name as vcf reader. I'll do this and then I'll say for record in VCF reader. And I'll actually just print the record first and then break. We never want to write too much code until we've, you know, been able to at least like run our script and check that it works. Great. The parts that I want to grab from here. So yeah, here Copilot is being very helpful. We have record.samples. So let's try to run it with that. Okay, there's a variant record samples object. After a bit of Googling on how to access the alleles, this is basically what we want. These are the alleles that we want to keep. So they're all numbers. You can see there's some zeros and some ones. There can even be some twos and higher numbers like that. So if the variant is multi-allelic, then you know, zero always refers to the reference. One refers to the first alternate allele, two to the second alternate allele, three to the third alternate allele, and so on. Now, I'll also take samples, which will be sample for sample in that's just record dot samples that's how we got the sample names originally and so we should be able to print alleles print samples and this should look pretty reasonable but there's all our sample names and there's all of our alleles so we have two lists and they're in the same order. What we're printing is all of the samples, but for only a single SNP. And we need more information than that. So what we can do is collect all of this into some lists. So let's collect genotypes and let's collect samples. The samples I'm okay if we continue overwriting the samples every single time because it's always going to be the same. And then genotypes out of pandaleles. Thank you, copilot. That's exactly what I wanted to do here. And then we don't really need to break. What I do need to do, and I'll show you what happens, is this is just going to run for a really, really long time. So 
we probably want to have some kind of a counter counter plus equals one and if counter is greater than a hundred then we can break that way we're just testing with the first 100 snips and we're not you know needing to wait a very long time every time we run this so now this is good and let's print genotypes beautiful so oh yeah this is good let's do length of genotypes that's 101 that's because i said if it's greater than 100 but i meant greater than or equal to 100 so now let's think again what do we want to do with the genotypes we have a bunch of numbers it's like a list of a list of tuples at this point and what we want is to have it in like a numpy array or something where we can then later run pca on it so let's just import numpy import numpy snp and then we go np dot array genotypes and i'll actually just reset that and then i'll print the shape of genotypes and that should be interesting okay so we have a hundred we have 1092 which if you remember was the number of samples that we found in the panel file so that's cool and this is the two chromosomes for each person so it's the first hundred snips yeah first hundred variants all the samples and two chromosomes per person per position great okay so we have this array this is our giant matrix that we wanted there's one more thing that we need to do with it though see we have two numbers per person per position i need a matrix that only has the first two dimensions but not this third dimension i need a row or column for snips and i need a row or column for samples but i don't need a third dimension of chromosomes i need that to be collapsed into a single number so the way that we want to do that is count the number of non-zero alleles basically we want to count how many alt alleles each person has because the reference is a fairly common allele in many places in the genome we're looking across so many SNPs that it doesn't matter when we have multi allelics and things like that like we don't really care like we can do this fairly roughly and the results will still come out really good so what we'll do is count the number of non-zeros and actually numpy has something for this just to show you an example of what this would look like is this one will be a zero this would be a one this would be a two and then one and zero and zero and so on okay so hopefully that's enough of an explanation of that but for the non-zeros when we're generating our matrix we want to do numpy count non-zero genotypes axis equals two actually and then just print matrix.shape to make sure that we did this with the right axes right it's all about like in numpy you always have to pay attention to what the shapes are that you are working with so let's try this and this is good we now have snips and samples but we don't have a third dimension anymore so that's our matrix now based on that matrix we can already run pca if we want so one thing to notice here is that it is going to take us a while to read through the whole vcf file so ways that we can deal with that are using something like this where we only read some of the file we could also read all of it and just wait if you really need all of it and you don't want to wait then you can do some sharding and things like that but that usually ends up taking longer unless you're going to run it many 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 times and so here what i would probably do is use 
a cutoff like this, which would mean that we're only using like the beginning of chromosome 22, which because of linkage disequilibrium, we're gonna be capturing only some of the variation by doing this. And so what we could also do if we don't want a huge output and we don't want to spend way too much time on it is that we could skip most of the data and sample like one SNP for every hundred SNPs. And that way we get it spread across the chromosome at least because SNPs that are close together will probably show the same data anyway. Like they'll show the same trends and the same, you know, they'll tend to correlate very highly with each other. That's linkage disequilibrium. So if we spread it across the chromosomes, we're going to get more coverage, so to speak, of the chromosome. So what we could do is say if counter mod 100 equals zero, that will be only every 100 rows. I only at this point want to actually do all of this. And so this way you would be limiting it pretty nicely. If I then set when a counter is greater than, you know, a much higher number now, then this should run 100 times. And so we should still get kind of a shape of, yeah, 100 here. And notice it doesn't take that much longer, even though we're reading more of the file. So yeah, we can kind of use this approach to sample more across it. And you can decide to set this and this however you want so that it runs fast enough on your computer, but you still get some decent coverage of the chromosomes. So at this point, I soon want to move into Colab because that's where it's going to be easier for us to do some visual analysis and plot our results from PCA. But we can also do PCA just right now. We could also do the plotting right now and then just open them as images and so on. All of these things basically work. It's just about what's going to be easier for you to work with. So one reason to do this in two pieces is also that reading through the whole VCF is going to take a little while. So we might want to do that once, create a matrix, and then play with that matrix more from Colab. So that's generally what I would recommend, is if you have something that takes a long time, then at least separate that into a separate step so that you can run that once and then play with the results. Um, for now, let's go straight in and just run PCA on our current matrix as it is. So we can say from sklearn import, I want decomposition. And then in decomposition, we have, oh, look at that, PCA and components equals two, sweet. So let's do that. And I think we can do PCA.fit of this matrix. Oh, and I should also mention that you can pip install scikit-learn like this. We also want to go pca.transform. And so this lets you run the transform that you just discovered based on the matrix. You can run that like on a different matrix, which has the same kinds of rows and columns, like the same meaning. So this is where you could, you know, train on one data set and then run it on a different test set to see if the results generalize. Here we're just going to run it on the same as the quote training data. And that's because we are not really doing like machine learning that we're trying to productionize. We're just trying to get everything we can from the data that we already have. So we're just going to do the transform on the matrix itself. And so this is basically the transformed data that we want to plot. So I'm just going to call it to plot. And let's print the shape of that so we can see what we get at the end. Ah, so this has 100, which are the SNPs. So this has run PCA on the SNPs. We want to run this on the samples. So we're actually going to flip the matrix around. And this capital T right here is 
uh, for transpose. So we're going to run that. And that gives us basically like the other way around. I'll move this down here so you can see what this now looks like. And this should now give us the samples, our 1092 samples in the first dimension. Excellent. So now we are plotting our samples according to PCA of their genotypes. Excellent. At this point, I would love to visualize this and let's try to gather this into a data frame where we can put all of the data that we have so far. And that way we can pull it up in Colab. We can more easily visualize it. We can rerun the PCA and I can also show you how to run TSNE, things like that. But we also want to be able to put some of that population data in there and so on. So, right, because we have this panel file that we haven't actually used yet. Let's take what we have, export it, and load it up in Colab. So the first thing I can do is, of course, go up and get pandas. So import pandas as pd is the normal way that we do it. And we want to say pd.dataframe. Maybe I could actually save the matrix itself where the columns equals variant IDs. And where do we get the variant IDs from? Index equals samples is correct. So this is the samples from up here. I'll do a data frame like this. And I could do, I could write it to a CSV file, yes. But where do we have variant IDs from? Do I have variant IDs? Have I collected them? No, I have not. So that's another thing that we could collect up here. Oh, I want to do it at the top level. It's kind of fun to have variant IDs. I don't think we actually need them for anything, but it's also just to label our data so that we can actually like refer to that later if we need to. So if we are recording this particular thing, then we could do variant IDs dot append record dot ID. And let's print the variant IDs to make sure that this is working. Let's just run it and see if it works. This now produced a matrix.csv file and look at that beauty. We have SNP IDs as our columns and we have the samples being rows. This is also good because as we saw with PCA, if we want to plot the samples, like if we want in our plot each dot to be a sample, then we're going to need to make the samples be the rows. Uh, because generally we plot rows, whereas columns are properties of the data points. So here, of course, we have many, many, many columns, but it's fine. We will actually add a few more onto this. but. This is cool, right? We have a NumPy array and we can just make it into a data frame just like that. And Pandas is totally okay with that. But of course, you always want to check what's actually coming out so you can see uh, whether you're getting what you expect. So this is great. We're writing our matrix to a CSV file. Let's see if we want to add something additional from this panel file. So let's take a look at the panel file. In here, we have the first column is the sample, and then the second column is our population code, which is the key we can use to then look things up in this TSV file that we have over here. We have these population codes, and then there's extra information about them. So I'll wait to wrap this one in until we get to Colab, so I can you know show you this from multiple perspectives, basically. But Let's first take the panel file so that we can add just a nice little column of population code to this particular CSV file. So we could do that. We want to read in, we want to do that here where we say like df population 
code. Let me call it. Okay, there's no name for it in here. In this one, it's called population code. I can give it the exact same name just so that they'll merge nicely later. So this is going to be something. We need to read it in from a file first. We need to gather them. So let's do with, I'm going to read a normal file. So we have the panel file, let's say labels for, okay, so I, I want a label like this, which has sample ID to population code so that it's a lookup, right? So we're, we're using a dictionary for this. So it's easy to look by for each sample. What is its population code? That lets us easily populate that column in the data frame. So I'm going to go for each line in the panel file. Let's do, oh yeah, line equals strip dot split. Yep, that's good. I'm going to split by tab specifically. And let's see, if I look at our panel file, the first column is the sample ID. So that's the key to the dictionary. And then the second column is the one we want to set as population code. So Colab's guess was correct here. And let's just print labels and run this real quick because I just want to see what we get. And yeah, this looks very reasonable. Okay, so for this, we can actually use the index of the data frame. So you can do df.index.map of labels. That looks good. Let's try running this again and see if we get what we want here. Let's look at matrix. So it gets added to the last column, but that's fine. But look, GBR, that looks correct. We could, of course, test a few of them, see if they are what we want them to be. But it looks like we have good representation of all of them. And the column name should be population code. Yep. I'll now start opening a collab notebook that we can go and continue playing with this from. And while I do that, I'll ask it to basically run it on the whole file. I think this should be fine. We counted before how many rows we actually have. So that was this many. It's good to give yourself an idea of progress so that you know whether something's gonna last an hour or five minutes or <laughs> whatever. So we could say if counter and then like this, that's every 1% basically. I want to figure out the percentage so I could do counter divided by that total. So now when I run it, it should tell me that it's like 8% done right now. That's very acceptable. So I'm gonna go and open up a collab notebook. So here you just go to collab.research.google.com or search for collab. Okay, so it looks like our matrix is finished and we have many, many snips. There should be way more than the last times we looked at it. So let's load in our matrix.csv. Here I'll just, when you do the uh, exclamation point, it makes it bash whatever you're typing. So this is a good way to just like check that our data is here, which you can also do by looking here, but I'm paranoid. So what we want to do next is let's import pandas as PD so that we can load our file. I'll start with this and then I'll go read CSV matrix.csv and let me look at the data frame. It's a little big, but yeah, ta-da. Okay, so look at this. We have 
many columns, almost 5,000 columns, and we have our 1,092 rows. So great. Now, one thing I don't like about this is that this column is named unnamed, and there might be a way to fix that in our other script, but let's just do a quick rename. And you can just like look up how to do this. I think this should work. And we're going to rename that column to sample in place equals true and then df. And let's just see if that worked. Great. It did. OK. So now we also know that we have a column at the end here called population code. So I'm just going to collect the columns that are not snips. Population code is one of them. And the other non snip column is sample. Beautiful. So those are good to take a look at. Now, if I wanted to regenerate the matrix from this, these are the two columns that I would have to exclude first. Let me show you what would happen if we did like, so we do, we try to convert the whole matrix to NumPy so that we have a matrix again and we can run PCA on it. Can you run PCA on the entire data frame? Maybe you can. Probably not. So if I try to make a matrix from the whole data frame and we do want to test matrix.shape, that's good. I'll print matrix.shape and then still show the matrix after because that's nice. Okay. And then let's do our decomposition again. So import or from sklearn import decomposition. I hope I spelled that right. And then we do decomposition dot PCA again. And components equals two, let's say. I'll just call this PCA. And then we can do PCA dot fit on the matrix. I have to run this cell first to import it. And then this will, huh? So could not convert string to float. So it looks like PCA needs to be numbers. And so we're going to have to cut out our non snip columns first. So that's not too surprising, right? Let's call it DF of just snips will be df dot so there's a way you can drop columns which we're going to drop the non snip columns and if we say axis one that means we're dropping columns if we say axis equals zero we're dropping rows those would both work but we're going to do this and that's how we get our matrix oh i have to remember to run the cell first and then run this cell and there we go and now when I run PCA, that seems to be working. What I can do with this PCA is I can print the explained variance ratio, for instance. That's good. And I can also print the singular values. And so you get this nice information, which you can interpret roughly along the lines of as I go from the first to the nth principal component of our PCA, how much of the variance in the original data can I explain? You can plot these. That's usually pretty interesting. So that just gives you like a brief sense of what's going on there. But now that we have that, we can also run the transform, which we did before. So pca.transform, and so we're going to just do to plot.shape and check that it is all good. And now I should be able to plot it. So now we're finally getting to the plotting part. And here you could try to just like do it. Oh, I need import map plot. 
lib.py plot as plt. And then do this. So it needs an x and a y. Let's first take a look at to plot. It has a shape of this. So if I basically did this would be x and that would be y. And we have a plot. Look at that. That's beautiful. There's like three clusters. Excellent. So now we get into needing to, you know, put some of the labels back on. Like now we have this. We're like, th this is what we wanted, right? This is what we've been working towards. We did a PCA and we plotted it. Let's just celebrate that for a second. Now I'm really curious what these three clusters are and what are the points that are spread in between them. So we have a lot of information about these. The first thing that we have is that population code. And then we can use another file that we saw earlier to get additional information on what these mean. So we could also take some of that and, and add it onto our data frame so that we can see what else is going on. So lots of options here. Now, at this point, I'm going to change from using matplotlib to using Altair. This works in this case because we have under 5,000 rows, but Altair is a little easier to work with in terms of specifying color schemes and all of this stuff. It just has a lot more like visualization features that are actually nicely built into it. It has something akin to the grammar of graphics that you see in ggplot in R as well. There's also ggplot in Python, but it's not as useful and smooth as it is in R. So what I like to use these days in Python is Altair. And I only like to use matplotlib when I have to, because I have more than 5,000 points that I want to plot. So let's, let me show you what it looks like to work with Altair. Altair is really nicely working with pandas data frames. So we basically want to first make a data frame that contains everything that we want to plot. So with Altair, we need a smaller data frame first. So let's make a data frame for the plotting. And here we can basically grab the non-snip columns that we had before from the data frame. And let me make an actual copy of the data frame so that when we make changes to it or add additional columns, it doesn't also happen to the original data frame. We want to add additional things to this. So our df plot, we can add pc1 equals what we used for x up here. Let me steal those. So we get this to plot and this. There and good. Okay, so now we have additional things in our data. So the reason that you want to build a smaller data frame is that when you work with Altair, whatever data frame you're using is going to be encoded in every plot, the entire data frame, even the columns that you're not using yet. That's just because of how Altair works. It runs JavaScript, actually. And it's really smooth when you're doing collab, but it can also be a little finicky sometimes because it's in JavaScript, but it is extremely flexible and I love it for many reasons. Now I think we have something that we are ready to plot. So we do alt.chart and we put in our data frame that we want and we say mark point because I'll just start with a scatter plot to match what we were doing before. And then for encode, I want X to be PC1 and I want Y to be PC2. And let's plot that first. Excellent. So this gives us the same plot we looked at before, except we, you know, at least have like nice labels. And I think the plot already looks quite a lot easier to read. 
we can set the color based on any column that we want as well. So I can color by population code and booyah. Isn't that beautiful? So this looks great, first of all. You can see definite clustering of the points, but we also have the issue that the color scheme does not have enough colors in it to uniquely represent every population group. You can see it starts repeating. The blue starts again down here. So that's not ideal. We definitely need separate colors if we're going to be labeling this many populations. There are many ways you can go from here. We are basically done with the core premise of the video at this point, so I will show you a few tricks fairly quickly here. So if we do alt.color for this, that lets us set additional properties like a scale. And you can look all this up in the documentation, but category 20 is a color scheme that has, you know, 20 colors in it. And so that lets us see a little bit more detail here. Something else that we wanted to do was load in the data file, load in that TSV file with the population data. And we could actually try to see if we can combine this by loading it in as well. Oh, this looks like some columns have eight fields and some have nine. I'm guessing that this is because it's trying to separate with spaces and I actually want to make sure that it's tabs. Okay, so we have our population code, which is the same one that we have in our data set. So now we should be able to add this, like kind of merge it with our DF plot data frame. So DF plot dot merge pop and you say on equals this is population code. So if you remember, this is population code, and that's also what we called it in our other matrix, in our other data frame up above. So if that's not the case, then you can just add an additional column so that both data frames have a column with the same name and the same values in it. So the population code is what we have for that here. And how equals inner. Okay, so we have population code, we have sample, we have our two principal components, and we have the additional data here. So Tuscany in Italy, Great Britain, British in England and Scotland and you have your additional information here. So we can also do superpopulation name, which is cool. So now we have this. Now let me just check that the DF plot hasn't actually been changed by this. Yeah, it's still just a small thing. So now I feel safe to overwrite our original data frame with this. I still want the preview so I can see what I've been doing. And now it has in fact been overwritten. Great. So now we can make a new Altera plot. I wanted to use superpopulation name this time. So this is because right now we have too many populations, right? And that can be nice, but let me just see if I can do it by, by a larger group like superpopulation and see what that looks like. So if I do this by superpopulation instead of that, we get this. Ooh, wow, that is beautiful separation. So the African ancestry is its own cluster. European is one cluster with the American kind of drifting around and like around the European and towards the other populations, which is super cool. And then you have your East Asian ancestry down here. So that is just really cool. If we want to see this from different perspectives, you could also add something like a fill color, which you could put back to population code. 
and that way the inside of the circle will be different colors and so on and like you can kind of combine different things it doesn't look super great but there's many things you can play with you can play with sizes you can play with the uh, shapes i think there's one additional thing i wanted to show you which is that you can also run tsni let's take an example yeah this is always good you can always like take the examples that they have and just you know copy them for your own purposes so we have our import we have this is a little bit of magic holding down shift and option at the same time while dragging across will let you select things on multiple lines x is going to be our matrix and then the rest is just good oh we have to run this first and then run this and notice this is taking longer than when we ran pca tsni is just more compute intensive than PCA. In fact, you can initialize it from PCA. Just a warning on TSNI. PCA is a very principled, like principled component analysis, uh, way of looking at data. The first principal component is always going to be the same. You can't run PCA in different ways. You can't fudge the parameters. You can only change the input data. For TSNI, there's parameters that you can work with. That's why it also has things like a learning rate and you can initialize it in different ways. There's a lot more almost like p-hacking that you can do with TSNI where you can get it to kind of fit your data into a pattern that you want it to have. So you should be a little bit careful uh, messing too much with the parameters of TSNI and trusting results coming from other papers or something where they have messed with the parameters a fair amount. So that's just something to pay attention to. So that's an aside. Let's take our DF plot and add in. So I'm going to call this TSNI1, just like for the first component. You could also say like component one or something. And this would be X embedded, maybe this. Does that work? Yes. And I'll do this for TSNI2 as well. And now let's look at what we have in DF plot now. So we have all the population stuff we had before. Now, because we added TSNI last, it goes over here. You can rearrange the order of columns, but it doesn't really matter uh, unless you're trying to make a pretty report or something. So this is good. We have our TSNI coordinates. So that means that now we can plot that as well. So I can go and grab the plotting code that we just used. Actually, I don't want this one that ended up a little ugly. Copying the plotting code. And I can use TSNI1 and TSNI2 instead of PC1 and PC2. I'll keep the super populations and get rid of the fill. And there we go. Oh, that is interesting. The clustering appears to be significantly different from before. There's still clearly clustering, so it hasn't completely randomized or anything. But yeah, this is PCA. And this is TSNI. I'll do them so that they're the same colors and everything. So it really looks as if some of these points that were perhaps the points that were spread out between the populations in TSNI ended up getting clustered very differently. So this actually does show that, you know, like the East Asian ancestry is getting broken up into different groups and so on. To me, this PCA plot makes more sense. One fun thing that you can do is do a transpose of the matrix and run PCA again. And basically see how you in that case are plotting by SNPs instead of by samples. I've tried this myself, but I don't want to spoil it for you. This could be a fun thing to, uh, to try on top of this. Just transpose the matrix and run it again through PCA. If you want to know more about working with pandas and Altair, I did a whole video on this where I used mint data instead of biological data, but it's 
basically the exact same fundamentals of working with pandas and Altair. So I'll link that video as well. All right, so that's all I wanted to show today. I hope this gives you an idea of the whole flow of how to do a small bioinformatics project like this. I did try doing this once before actually filming the video, so I had some notes to kind of go back to. It probably took me something like four hours to do this originally. I've cut it down a little bit for the video, just cutting down the googling and trying different VCF parsing libraries that were hard to install and things like that. Another thing I'll note is that I did this eight years ago, right before starting grad school when I was still an undergrad and I was taking linear algebra and so on. And so I used this as my linear algebra final project. And it's great for that, where I, would, I definitely went into more detail on the singular value decomposition, what eigenvalues mean and so on. And so all of that is an additional tangent that you can go down and like learn more about it, but it's incredibly easy to just run PCA with scikit-learn without actually knowing what it does. So I will say that I definitely knew exactly what it was doing back when I originally did this, and so there was a lot more interpretation of what the PCA means that I was able to do for that project. And here I'm just, you know, showing you the pretty plot and we're kind of leaving it at that, but you can go to your linear algebra textbook or something and like look up how PCA really works and you can go a little bit deeper if you want to. So that's it for now. Thank you and see you in another video. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. YouTube thinks you'll like this video and this is a video that I think you'll like engage with the YouTube video in the way that you see that